All right, welcome to another IAEI News Live. I'm Thomas Dimitrovich, and today's topic, the 2023 code changes that significantly impact residential dwelling unit applications, and it all starts now. All right, welcome back. So this is a recorded session because right now I'm actually uh, traveling again, talking about electrical safety. And this topic is a part of my discussion for tomorrow, which is uh, which is Tuesday, which is why I can't um, I can't uh, be live right now. So this is recorded and I'm basically going to be uh, going to share with you something that I'm talking about right now at a venue where we're talking electrical safety and safe work practices and national electrical code and all that great stuff. So uh, what we're going to focus on or uh, 2023, we're going to look at the 2023 code changes. And and quite frankly, when you look at some of these um, requirements or some of these uh, applications, there you'll you'll uh, you'll see that there is a a change uh, that is going on f- over maybe even sometimes in some cases the last two cycles. So what some of the items that we're going to cover today are not just new changes they are a continuation of uh, a process of identifying hazards and addressing them so that's what i want to talk about today so let's uh, let's kick this off by taking a look at 2023 code changes that impact on residential applications and all right here we go okay so so um <laughs> a few of the areas that uh, service entrance equipment we saw changes during the 2020 uh code uh, 2017 2020 and into the 2023 code cycle uh, areas of discussion include uh, six disconnect rule uh, surge uh, requirements we saw 2020 have uh, new surge requirements uh, that that directly impact service entrance equipment. Um, there's working space requirements, but I, I didn't throw that into this discussion because I just think that um, I don't know. In my opinion, uh, the working space area is probably a lot more of an impact on commercial applications than it is residential dwelling unit applications. But we could make an argument for multifamily uh, type of applications. But uh, I'm leaving that out for now. Uh, the emergency disconnect we saw uh, we saw over the last three cycles, or uh, over the last two cycles, and I say three meaning the 2023 code cycle. So for at least three cycles now, we have seen changes that directly try to um, uh, address first responders. If you recall, and we'll get into this, but if you'll recall uh, the first round which failed actually at the floor of the annual meeting, I think they called it the firefighters disconnect. Uh, and I know we had um, we had some debates around that and those requirements. And so it failed the first time around, it passed the second time around, and as you're going to see, it's starting to expand uh, its application. And we've got to be thinking about this emergency disconnect because if you're not uh, in certain applications and we're trying to address uh, some areas where uh, it can be a challenge, um, we're gonna we're, you'll you'll see how it's going to impact possibly some of your design. Uh, AFCI and GFCI, I mean a residential a residential discussion of code changes would not be. Um, wouldn't be any anything if it didn't include AFCIS and GFCIS 210.8 and 210.12. So we're going to talk about that. Um, uh, we're we're going to hit search. Uh, it saw a it, in any introduction in the 2020 code. We saw some focus around surge requirements, and um, the 2023 code cycle is not going to disappoint in that regard. And islands and peninsulas, uh, you're going to see a, a significant change there. And also, uh, not including here, I forgot, I'm going to hit some of the lighting requirements. So hopefully, if we have some time, uh, there are some um, 
requirements with regard to um, there's a permission an allocation to use a wireless controller and I want to talk a little bit about that because I think that's going to see uh, an impact possibly especially into the future there's some changes that happened last cycle and maybe some changes that didn't happen this cycle that some people wanted to see happen um, and it may impact moving on in the forward so we're going to talk about those lighting controls as well all right so uh, when you think about residential code changes you got to think about it, it, the requirements that are out there that impact your design, that impact uh, the maybe the product that you have to install. For example, tamper resistant receptacles. Good example, in my opinion, uh, where you would say it, there's if you put a, a standard receptacle in an application where all of a sudden you might have a new requirement that required a tamper resistant. It's not uh, going to change the fact that you have a receptacle where you have the receptacle. It's just what type of receptacle is permitted to be installed there. Um, AFCIs and GFCIs, I could say that that may impact your design. For example, if you do a lot of shared neutrals and you don't want to do two pole breakers, but you want to do single pole breakers, um, in some applications, you may have to change how you do your wiring practices. I know many contractors changed their wiring practices because of the technologies of AFCIs and GFCIs for a lot of different reasons. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But, but when you think about code changes, think about it through the eyes of your design and think about it through the eyes of maybe um, you know a, a, a requirement for a specific product. And you can't forget about state adoption. Not every state adopts January 1st, 2023. So there's a process. There are still states on 17 code, believe it or not. Um, and there are still jurisdictions that don't adopt a code. So uh, be mindful that all of that makes a difference, uh, especially if you are, um, um, if you're looking at, uh, you know, if you have if you have a new room that requires AFCI, or you have a new area that requires GFCI, uh, you may want to adjust how you design and lay out your system uh, to minimize uh, minimize um, impact in case there's a trip on that circuit. Uh, minimize leakage currents in your applications. We saw that in Article 555. Go take a look at the ground fault requirements in Article 555 for marinas. We made some, uh, I think, uh, interesting approaches to tiered levels of ground fault protection. GFCI, ground fault protection of equipment at 30 milliamps, ground fault protection of 100 milliamps. So, and we did that because of the concern for leakage currents and, and things of that nature. So we have that elevated uh, leakage current allowance. But in any case, um, in some cases, it may impact your design. Now, let's talk about, I'm going to kick this off with 210.8. There are a lot of changes in 210.8, as usual. And I'm sure that if you do residential dwelling units, and and, and I'll say, I'm going to, I'm going to, walk into um, commercial applications 210.8b as well I might as well hit that I can just quickly go down through some of those changes um, that's not a big deal um, all right so let's take a look boom so you'll see that um, 210.8 <laughs> I just have to get to the right location here slash 70 next if you want to follow along remember you can go to www.nfpa.org 70 next and you can see the uh, first and second draft if you really want to understand the code changes and you're looking at uh, nfpa's website you've got to look at the first draft and the second draft you can't just go to the second draft unless you know exactly all the words for each of these sections the second draft will may not provide you with the underline and strikeout for the changes that occurred in the first draft that didn't change in the second draft. So keep that in mind. Okay, so 
uh, dwelling units other than dwelling units, crawl space, lighting outlets, crawl space did not change. Specific appliances, significant change there. Um, equipment requiring servicing, not really a big significant change there. I think it's pretty much, we, we may have made some minor changes. Uh, and then outdoor outlets, that's the point of contention for everybody. I know that, and I know the compatibility concerns with HVAC equipment is out there. I'll show you what uh, what's going on with that. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, temporary interim amendments, TIAs, that were passed. All right, so uh, in the parent text of 210.8, now you might say, uh, in reality, you might say, look, Tom, um, GFCIs, we're going to buy a list of GFCIs anyway. Uh, but in the code, we didn't really point out that the ground fault circuit interrupter has to be listed. In fact, we didn't point out in any previous editions that a molded case circuit breaker had to be listed. So those changes are a part of the 2023 code cycle. Uh, not that you would have to... Um, not that it would, you know, uh, you probably already brought listed circuit breakers. You probably all already purchased listed ground fault circuit interrupters. So not necessarily a big change, but it is a level of awareness that uh, they have to be uh, listed. Uh, they, you'll see changes where they removed ground fault circuit interrupter and they use the acronym. Uh, not a big deal, in my opinion, but uh, just something. So here's the, here's what I think. Uh, you've got to at least understand that change was put in place so that you got to understand that when you're going to see GFCI a lot and you're going to see AFCI a lot, and if you don't know what the acronym is, then you've got to go find the first usage of it. So I, I have a, I have a, um, a love-hate relationship with this whole uh, acronym, first time you use it, then you use the acronym afterwards. And I, and I just ran across that uh, in... Um, I think it was Article 625. I can't remember which article I was looking at. There was an acronym they were using. And I'm like, what is that acronym? And I had to go up through the code section, uh, th through the whole article, to find the first use. So just, again, be mindful that if there's an acronym in the code, you may see an acronym and, and, and you wonder, well, it's not defined. What does that acronym mean? You may have to search for it, unfortunately. So maybe that's the power of um, NFPA link. <laughs> I don't know, but um, and the whole online experience. But just be mindful of that. Um, oh, so we removed the language for measuring uh, for measurements passing through a window. You know, if you think about it, that's always been a point of contention. So. The, the measurements, drop my glasses, <coughs> the, the measurements for, for two, for um, measuring, um, now, and we're going to talk a little bit about this too, but um, how do I say this? When we... When we have GFCI requirements, there's there was the um, there's the the determination of what receptacles require GFCI protection is typically the distance of the receptacle from the sink, right? So, and and two ten point eight a or two ten point eight. Uh, tells us the parent text that they, for the purpose of the section, the distance from receptacles shall be measured as the shortest path the power supply cord connected to the receptacle would follow without piercing a floor, wall, ceiling, or fixed barrier. So we removed window. And in the last cycle, remember in 2020, we took out that whole concept of a door, doorway. And the reason we took the door, we had to address the door, was because um, 
uh, the the, uh, the the garage, uh, the the appliance garages have a door on them, and if there's a receptacle on the countertop within six foot of that sink, and it's in and it's inside the appliance garage, somebody could say, look, that the uh, the uh, the receptacle behind that door for the garage appliance garage uh, does not need to be GFCI protected. That was not our intent. Uh, somebody could say that the receptacle under the sink, because the cord would have to go through uh, through the door. It's not need to be GFCI, GFCI protected. So those examples made it confusing. And we said, look, you know what? <laughs> We're just going to remove that reference to a door. Well, we had the same issue with windows. And and a lot, and in my opinion, uh, you might say... Um, you might say that um, uh, sometimes those pass-throughs, you, you might call it a window. I don't know if, sure if I'd call it a window. If I look at the Webster definition of what a window is, uh, you could be, you could have, there's a, enough room there for a debate and an argument. And we said, you know what, we're, we're just removing it. So well, how do you address a problem? It, what, what panel two is apparently saying is, look, okay, if you have a problem with uh, the word window, if, you don't, if you're confused with what a window is, then you know what, we're removing it. You don't know what a door is, and, and if you want to try to use the door as an excuse, we're taking the door out. So now the only, the, only, um, the way it's reading for purposes of measurement, the distance from the receptacle is measured through the shortest path. Power supply cord connected to the receptacle would follow without piercing a floor, a wall, a ceiling, or a fixed barrier. So we try to add clarity. That's sort of um, what's going on in that arena. Okay, so A, dwelling units. Now, one of the things that we did if you look at if you look at um, how do I say this? So kitchens. Let's start let's start with kitchens. If the previous language said where the receptacles are installed to serve the countertop surfaces, we removed that language and just said if you have a receptacle in a kitchen. And remember, the parent text in A says 125 volt through 250 volt receptacles installed in the in these locations, uh, supplied by a single phase branch circuit rated 150 volts or less to ground. These have to be ground fault protection. These are receptacle outlets. If you have a receptacle outlet in a kitchen, it's going to be GFCI protected. Now the challenges there are what's a part of the kitchen and what's not. So that's going to be the debate, right? Um, what area? It, what is the kitchen and 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 what receptacle is especially on sometimes on some of these walls where you might move out of the kitchen and maybe to a um, a breakfast nook or something like that so there's going to be the debate is that part of the kitchen is it not part of the kitchen that one receptacle that's on the wall is that a part of the kitchen or is it in the breakfast nook those are all the things the debates that are going to happen i'm sure but um any receptacle in a kitchen gfci protected then what we did was we took the language, if you remember, in 210.8b, <clears throat> in 210.8b last cycle, I believe it was last cycle, we said, we said, in addition to kitchens, we had areas with sinks and permanent provisions for food preparation, beverage preparation, or cooking. And it was the or cooking and not the and cooking that gets you out of saying it's a kitchen. So you may not have cooking provisions, but you have food preparation. And that keyed, uh, that was a key in to say you need to GFCI protect. And the target there really were like those Starbucks stations and, and similar. Well, um, somebody said, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Does the electron know that it's uh, not in a dwelling unit uh, if I have an area like that? And the electrons, I hate to break it to you, they're not that smart. So they're lazy and they always love to party. So any place where there's a fault, they just love to go there and they find the shortest paths. So in any case, they take all paths. So what we did in A was we said, Areas with sinks and permanent provisions for food preparation, beverage preparation, and then there's the or cooking. So we took the language from B and we placed it in A. In my opinion, in my opinion, very little impact in residential applications. In my opinion. 
because you asked for it, I gave it to you. All right, so um, all exceptions were located. Now, this is not a big change, but just be mindful that all of the exceptions are now placed at the end. And here's what we recognized. For example, um, remember we had an exception for receptacle supplying only a permanently installed what well, we used to have fire alarm or burglar alarm um, system are not required and and it was for the exception to basements so somebody on the panel asked the question what if the burglar alarm is in the garage what if the burglar alarm is in my laundry I need the GFCI protected, but then if you go back to, um, if you go back to uh, the the article that addressed say fire alarms, there was already the the requirement that you can't put those on a GFCI. So here's what we did: fire alarms were already covered, so we removed that in 760, uh, 41, and 121. Their uh, fire alarms are already addressed, so we didn't have to put the exception in 210.8. A for fire alarms because it's already in 760. If you have a fire alarm, you're not allowed to put it on a GFCI. So we took that reference out. But there's nothing in the National Electrical Code that dealt with, um, you would call it, what, what the code has historically called was burglar alarms. But we called that premises security system. That aligns with other codes and standards. So the premises security system is not currently addressed in the National Electrical Code. I can't go to like an equivalent 760.41 or 760.121 and find that you can't put those on a GFCI. So we left that in, but we removed the fire alarm. So the way the exception reads now is a receptacle supplying only permanently installed premises security system shall be permitted to omit ground fault circuit router protection but it's not just for basements i don't care where that's at you don't need to put gfci protection for that um, premises security system all right so that is um that's basically what we did there not a big change but something that you need to be aware of um, and then we, in the exceptions, they, you know, they added some new definitions for weight supporting ceiling receptacles and then weight supporting attachment fittings. Uh, we just basically changed the terminology and it's the, it's the same. So not as big of a deal there. So those were the changes that we saw in 210.8a. And I believe... Um, I would say out of all of those significant change kitchens, expansion in kitchens, that's the one that I would argue is the significant change in 210.8A for dwelling units. So all receptacles, uh, and that picks up any of those appliances, anything that's plugged in. All right, so we already talked about this. Um, already talked about that. Uh, moving the exceptions to the end. That was a style manual thing. And you see style manual. Um, and it actually, it streamlined those exceptions as well. And it expanded those exceptions. So, um, there was another one. Yeah, that was the other one. Exception number one. Remember the exception for readily accessible and 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 it was and it was um we expanded i think we expanded that for snow melting de-icing so it's readily it was, it's receptacles uh that are not readily accessible and are supplied by a branch circuit dedicated to electric snow melting de-icing or piping and vessel heating uh shall be installed in accordance with 426.28 as applicable now we also in in b that same receptor, that same one. Remember, the uh, the exception was for rooftops. We removed that reference to rooftops. We said, hey, if it's if it's serving this equipment, then it's going to need to be GFCI protected, regardless if it's on rooftops. So we sort of made that generic. And that, and I think the other one was for outdoors. I think it was an exception to three, if I'm not mistaken. You got, you're going to have to check that for me. But uh, I know we made a, a slight tweak for that. Um, yep, yeah, there was a new exception for four factory installed receptacles that are not really accessible. Now, 
This one here, I think that um, they're talking about those ceiling fans, like the 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 in the bathroom, where you have the fan that um, that does your exhaust. Uh, if you take the covers off, there's a little two pole, two prong receptacle in there that's meant for plugging in that fan. That's um, not doesn't need to be GFCI protected, and apparently somebody was requiring it um else we probably wouldn't have got the uh, public input and public comment so we added clarity that that those factory installed receptacles that are not readily accessible and are mounted internally to bathroom exhaust fans uh, do not need to be gfci protected okay so b let's talk just a real quickly about other than uh, dwelling units. We separated out two and three. So remember two was kitchens and areas with sinks and food. We just moved those into two separate. So there's no technical change there. We just moved those into uh, two, two individual. And I know I shouldn't even be talking about this, but I'm going to hit it anyway. There's a new list item four for buffet serving areas that have permanent provisions for food serving, beverage serving, and cooking. So there's a new item four. Uh, list item seven, sinks uh, where receptacle cords and plugs are stationary they added so now this is the concept and this is the reason why i wanted to talk about this because i think in my opinion you're probably going to see something along the dwelling unit side so what happens in b doesn't just stay in b <laughs> it influences changes in a so the discussion that we had at code panel uh, two was around the fact that the hazard is not the receptacle that's just a measurement method to identify what needs to be GFCI protected and what doesn't need to be GFCI protected. The hazard's really around the appliance. So what we did in B was we said, look, sinks, where receptacles or cord and plug connected, fixed or stationary appliances are installed within six foot. So it's not the receptacle, it's also if the appliance, the receptacle could be seven feet away from the sink, but if the appliance is within six feet of the sink, then you need to GFCI protect it. So we're focusing on the appliances, and this is a lead in a little bit to uh, the discussion that we're gonna have in a little bit. <laughs> that's going to be another impact to residential dwelling units. <clears throat> so that was seven. Now, eight. Simple change. Instead of, oh, yeah, instead of damp and wet locations, it's damp or wet locations. And you know what? I think we missed it. Yeah, we missed it in A. We still say damp and wet locations in A. We fixed it in B. Gosh darn it. Don't you just hate that? When you get it in one, but you didn't get it in the other. Anyway, and then we added, um, list item eight was cleaned up, right? But then uh, list item 13 is new. Aquariums, bait wells, and similar open aquatic vessels or containers, such as tanks or bowls, where receptacles are installed within six foot. Now, this is one of those that would be hard to migrate over to a dwelling unit. And, and, and for the purpose, for the reason that you don't know where someone's going to put an aquarium. But I'll tell you, you put an aquarium, and I, I know I had I, I had an aquarium, and you think about there's a there's a heater, right, that's plugged into the wall outlet, and that heater, where does it go? Directly in the water. And there's a pump, which I would say, man, that's probably the pumps I was experiencing, the, the unit was down and it was plastic tubing. So the heater though, directly in the water. And what am I doing? I'm in there cleaning tank. I'm I'm moving things around, got my hands in the water while that heater is directly in that tank. If there was a problem with that heater, I, 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 the nobody is I don't know what the knock on. There's no wood around here anymore. I haven't. I don't have any reports of people getting electrocuted due to uh, their you know, residential dwelling unit aquarium, but. Um, we had uh, good substantiation for aquariums, bait wells, and similar open aquatic vessels, and some interesting images of um, of those applications where you have these receptacles. That's not necessarily a sink, but what's the difference? So, and you have a lot of electronic equipment. So, um, you're going to see that. You see that in B. I don't know if you'll see that in uh, in A or not. 
And again, we move the exceptions down. So, okay. Now, this specific appliance. <clears throat> so think about this one. So cross-based lightings did not change specific appliances. Now, there's a debate. There's a debate um, in regard to <sighs> 422 is appliances, right? So 422 has requirements for <sighs> that impact appliances. And, and they'll call out specific appliances like tire uh, inflation machines, vending machines, sump pumps, etc. But 422 doesn't apply to the brand circuit. 422 focuses on the appliance. And, 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 and this is actually, there's, there's different opinions on this one. Um, and I, I hesitate to even give you my opinion. But just look at 422 and think about what is it what does its scope of work. Think about Article 210 and what is its scope of work. And I can tell you that the requirements that we're talking about in 210.8 uh, D are focused on the branch circuit because that's the scope of 210. And what the hopes are is that for for the branch circuit or an outlet, not a receptacle. So this is the importance of not putting, not, you, you can't say, well, that's already covered in 210.8a because 210.8a only covers receptacles. This is any outlet supplying a list of appliances. You have to GFCI protect. You have to provide that GSI protection for that outlet that is supplying these appliances. And, and we created the list, right? We created a, um, a list and we've expanded it. So what you're seeing here is you have automotive vacuum machines, drinking water coolers and bottle fill stations, high pressure spray washing machines, <clears throat> tire inflation machines, vending machines, sump pumps, and dishwashers. Now, if you go back to Article 422, you're going to find that same list. Now, what, what Panel 2 did was added electric ranges, wall-mounted ovens, counter-mounted cooking units, clothes dryers, and microwave ovens. Now, I'll give you a, a, a reason why. Two things. First, we had CPSC deaths on these equipment, on those wall mounted ovens, on those microwave ovens, clothes dryers. And remember the discussion earlier that we saw in 210.8B. It was the, and they made a change in 210.8B. It's the distance from the appliance to the sink. Now, one of the code panel members during our discussions, uh, I think accurately pointed out that you don't need water. You don't need a proximity to water to be electrocuted on this equipment. And it's not just the end, the, the um, failure of this equipment that drives the, G, the deaths, the GFCI uh, requirement or the, the, um, uh, the, the, the data point of deaths. In some cases, in many cases, we had examples of people who were working on these appliances. And if you think about what is a definition of justified energized work, one of those uh, reasons that you can uh, uh, perform energized work is for troubleshooting. And when you're trying to fix a microwave or fix a clothes dryer, you are probably troubleshooting and you can't turn it off. You can't just unplug it. Or if it's hardwired, you can't turn the circuit breaker off to establish an electrically safe work condition if you need to do testing and you're trying to figure out why the appliance isn't working. So we had a body count. We had people who were killed. We had, uh, um, a, a, we, had, we had qualified people who were working on it and unqualified people. And I'm not even going to entertain the discussion. You can do that on somewhere else on whether or not the qualified or the unqualified person uh, deserves that protection. We had uh, a, a number of deaths. Now, the other thing that this does, 
Because remember, in that discussion earlier, when I talked about no other than dwelling units, that they're doing the measurement from the appliance. If I have the appliance covered, so if you think about a residential kitchen, you probably have a range, an electric range. You might have a wall-mounted oven or a counter-mounted cooking unit, electric, obviously, uh, clothes dryers, definitely, microwave ovens. Those, whether they're hardwired or receptacle, cord and plug connected. If they're cord and plug connected and they're in a kitchen, covered. But what about hard wiring? The hazard is not removed because you took the receptacle out of the picture. The hazard is not the receptacle. The hazard is what's plugged into the receptacle. And if I hardwire an appliance in to get out of the GSEI requirements, you haven't removed the hazard. The hazard's the appliance. I, and I know if I was a, an appliance manufacturer out there, I'd say, well, you can't call my product an, a hazard. But any product at its end of life, or if I'm going to do maintenance on it, think about think about the, the requirements. Where is it? In two, uh, we have um, uh, equipment likely to be serviced. We have a receptacle requirement for that equipment. And what do we have? GFCI protection for those who are working on it with tools who are going to be plugging into that receptacle, working on uh, equipment that's required to be serviced, uh, have, have space for, for servicing, you know, HVAC equipment and others. We have to have GFCI protected receptacles. Well, this is no different. Very similar. I wouldn't say different, no different. It's not exactly the same, but it's very similar in my opinion. So that's sort of the way the discussions went on panel two. Uh, again, I'm not speaking on behalf of panel two. I'm just giving you my perspective. And it is my opinion, in my opinion only, not of IAEI, of anybody else. The NFPA, code making panel two, NEMA, anybody. This is, my, this is just, this is my opinion. I'm giving you, sharing with you the discussion that I was a part of. So that I think is, um, a significant change and I know it drove concerns about leakage current so here's what happens with leakage when you put these types of requirements on if any of these appliances use that equipment crowning conductor it's going to cause a GFCI to trip if it's not obviously we're not supposed to use the equipment grounding conductor for anything other than fault currents so <laughs> Article 250 tells us that. Uh, so are there some appliance manufacturers who are concerned about this? Yes, absolutely. Um, but the appliance standards are changing, and uh, many of the appliances are addressing this from a compatibility perspective. So that's all I'm going to say about that. That's all I have to say about that. All right. Um, outdoor outlets. So... So let's talk about outdoor outlets. So if I look at outdoor outlets, remember the, the concern on the outdoor outlets has been around the HVAC equipment. And, and um, we did have an exception for drives and uh, those with variable frequency drives and those split units. Um, and that exception expired for 20, January 1st, 2023, in the 2020 code, we did not elect as a code panel during the process to put that in, but a TIA was developed and accepted in time. So you should, as long as the Standards Council accepted what the panel accepted, which I, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't, but you know there was an appeal, so I don't know what the results of that appeal are yet. We'll know any minute. Uh, but if all goes as... Um, as I think it probably will, uh, you'll probably see that same exception back in there for split units and those with uh, adjustable frequency drive type of uh, technologies. There are still a lot of HVAC equipment out there that works perfectly compatible, but there are some that uh, have compatibility issues, and that is a point of debate and contention. All right, so let's talk about, that's pretty much 210.8 in a nutshell. So let's talk about 210.12. 210.12, they separated. So this is how the 2020 code was laid out. And in the 2023 code, they, they sort of reorganized. And this was um, this was actually Nihad Al-Sharif did a really good job. And he made a good argument that, you know, in 
and and he tried to align it a little bit like we do with 210.8 uh 210.8 you have uh, a is means of protection because there are different ways to 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 achieve your afci protection we'll talk about those b was dwelling units uh, C is dormitory units, and then D was other occupancies, and then E dealt with the bar branch circuit wiring extensions, modifications, and replacements. So we reorganized 210.12 a little bit. We did do some expansion. I'll cover that, but um, we didn't address the we did not address the means of protection. So you have um, the first means of protection. I don't know why that, that right there is there. But uh, in any case, um, the first is the listed combination type AFCI uh, at, the, uh, at the source of the branch circuit. The second one is a branch feeder plus an OBC AFCI. So you're ensuring the protection of the home run circuit. And then the third option is the uh, supplemental arc protection breaker plus an OBC AFCI and quite frankly uh, there's no supplemental arc protection there's no standard uh, for that product the system combination type AFCI with a, th a thermal magnetic breaker plus an OBC AFCI there is one manufacturer who's offering this listing it's a listed pair that includes an outlet and a thermal magnetic circuit breaker combined to provide the equivalent protection of a UL1699 device. So that product does exist on the market. Three does not, four does. Uh, I would say it's kind of hard to find a branch feeder type AFCI. So I would say two doesn't make sense, uh, but it's an option if you can find one. Uh, one uh, is uh, the readily available solution. And then there's uh, five and six. Five is your RMC, so you're protecting the home run circuit. Um, and then uh, six is the um, concrete. So just keep in mind that if you're, you know, that, that system combination AFCI paired up with an OBC, there are links associated with uh, that you're allowed to have for your AFCI protection. Uh, you can't go uh, beyond and those links are still the same. So as they were last cycle. So none of this changed in reality. The, um, the B for dwelling units, these, the, these 14 locations are the same 14 locations that we had last cycle and the cycle before. So we have uh, just put these into a list format. And again, Nihad had a really good uh, concept uh, that we took and we expanded on. And so 210.12B uh, just lists all of those rooms. 210.12C, uh, now you'll notice too, um, and which I didn't, I forgot, they added 10 amps in each of these. So in, in the dwelling unit, they added 10. So you have 10, 15, and 20 amp branch circuits. Is there a 10 amp AFCI? No, just like there's no supplemental arc protection and you probably can't find a branch feeder AFCI. Um, but you know, it's like Anna Marie obligated good seasons lady. It's in there. So if, uh, if you do start to see 10 amp branch circuits for lighting circuits only, remember, you gotta look at the requirements on where you can actually Im install a 10 amp circuit. We put some restrictions on what can be served. You can't reserve a receptacle outlet on a 10 amp circuit because we don't make 10 amp receptacles. So um, you, but you can do that on lighting circuits. And if it's in a residential dwelling unit in any of those rooms in A, you're going to need to have AFCI, but we again, we don't make a 10 amp AFCI yet. Um, so in dormitory units, we've got the 10 amp AFCI, and then we add these six rooms. So you have bedrooms, living rooms, hallways, closets, bathrooms, and similar rooms. And that, that has not changed. That was the same as it was. We just added it into a list format. Now you got your other occupancies. Uh, what we added here was areas designed for use exclusively as sleeping quarters in fire stations, police stations, ambulance stations, rescue stations, ranger stations, and similar locations. So that is a new uh, requirement for the 2023 code. And not a dwelling unit, but I am just threw it in there because it's a bonus question. Um, all right, so and then okay, so now we're, we're going to get out of AFCIs. Two thirty dot seventy one. Now two thirty dot seventy one. 
I don't know if I have it here. 230. Jeez. <clears throat> you know that these these items, uh, the meter centers were the problem. So this is the 2020 code put in this provision that said, look, we're gonna we're gonna try what they were trying to address was remember we put the line side barrier requirements in. To, to barrier off the line side service entrance equipment, service over current protective device. And we said, look, panel boards, you can't do six disconnects on a panel board anymore, period. You're gonna have to put a main breaker in a, in a panel board. Can't have a panel board with six disconnects because of that big bus that's in the middle. Well, meter centers have the same problem. Now the standards are trying to figure out how to address a meter center to where you can open an enclosure for a circuit breaker and not have anything else exposed barrier off the line side and still has six disconnects but i'm telling you it's going to be a tough one so what we did was we made a change where we recognized that in 230 we said look meter centers we added a line item in 23071 we added a specific line item, and I just got to find it here. Here we go. We added this metering centers with a main service disconnecting means in each metering center. Now, we added that in 5, in 230.71.5, but we, um, we did not remove it from four, which says service disconnects and switch gear, transfer switches, or metering centers, where each disconnect is located in a separate compartment. So that's what we're struggling with right now, is how do you create a metering center with circuit breakers in separate compartments? And it would be like saying, how do I make a panel board with circuit breakers in separate compartments? I don't know that the standard's gonna get there. They're trying, but I don't know that they're gonna get there with language that will actually make it manufacturable and cost effective so metering centers be mindful that's going to be a challenge if you use meter centers that's going to be a challenge for you uh and then and this doesn't impact um this doesn't impact uh residential but unless you have a, a house like joseph wages where you have motor control centers uh, but most of us don't have that so anyway um, so that's a that's a, a big change. Uh, emergency disconnects. Remember, this was uh, the fire. We called it the firefighter disconnect. So we have two thirty point eighty five. Now I'll tell you. Here's what's happened. So you have emergency disconnects for one and two family dwelling units. An emergency disconnecting means shall be installed. Uh, the disconnecting means shall be installed in a readily accessible outdoor location within sight of the dwelling unit. There's a discussion about rating. There's the grouping requirements. And then there's the disconnect the, and the different methods. And those methods didn't change. You have the service disconnect. You have a meter disconnect integral with the meter mounting equipment, not, mar uh, not marked as suitable only for use as service equipment. You have other listed disconnect switch or circuit breaker that is marked suitable for use as service equipment, uh, but not marked as suitable only for use as service equipment. So they added some clarity there. I mean, I don't think that's anything huge uh, but you do have to understand those language, that language if you're using that disconnect. Um, and they added replacements. You know, where service equipment is replaced, all of the requirements of this section shall apply. There is an exception for when you have meter sockets, service entrance detectors, or related raceways and fittings are replaced, the requirement of the section shall not apply. Um, and there's identifications of other isolation disconnects. They got rid of the word emergency there. God only knows why. Where, um, where equipment for isolation of other energy sources systems is not located adjacent to the emergency disconnect, blah, 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 blah. So they do have that. And they have a marking requirement. This So they separate, they reorganize this section for you. And most of the changes aren't as sig that significant because they're, they're tweaking. But um, just be mindful that, um, that, that, that they did reorganize that. Now, they did add... They did add um, another area. Um, there we go. Here's your other area. 225 outdoor circuits. 
So I'll tell you the discussion that we had on panel 10 on this one. If, so here's, here's, here's what you had. Here was the example that we were given. The service is say out at the, out at the road. And maybe if it's even down the road and you may not even know that that service is for which, which service is for which home on that road. What they wanted to do, instead of putting the emergency disconnect out there on the road, they wanted to put it near the house. So you're going to have an outside feeder. So if your service is out there at the road, then you're going to have a two Article 225 feeder that has to feed the structure. And it says you have a readily you have to have an emergency disconnect at a readily accessible outdoor location for one and two family dwellings that are served by feeders. So you have the services in 230 and these outside outside feeders uh, in 225 to address that scenario where the service is out there at the road, for example. Um, and you they they want it within um, readily accessible uh, at that at that dwelling unit. So that's sort of what they did uh, in 225.41. All right, so uh, the emergency disconnect is important. Surge is another area that's that got some love. 230.67. 230.67. Um, you have a, a 220 uh, in in in. 2023 we expanded remember 2020 code saw the first requirement for surge in dwelling units 2023 expanded um, those requirements 230.67 so let's go to 230.67 because I'll tell you what they did <clears throat> tell you what they did they yeah. All right, so 230.67, we separated A, surge protected device, B, location, C, type, replacement, and then ratings. So what they did was uh, in, in A, they said, look, you need to have it for dwelling units, but also dormitory units, guest rooms and guest suites of hotels and motels, and areas of nursing homes and limited care facilities and exclu used exclusively as patient sleeping rooms. So those locations now have so So remember, before it was just dwelling units. They expanded beyond dwelling units. In B, you have the location. It has to be an integral part of the service equipment or immediately adjacent there too. And I'll tell you, the most important thing is the lead length between that bus and that surge protected device. Don't be extending it. The shorter you can get it, the better off you are because every inch reduces the level of protection. It increases the let through voltage. Very important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they, they, you can put a type one or a type two, and if the services uh, equipment is replaced, it has to be. Uh, you have to follow the rules, so you're going to be putting surge in, and then the ratings. Uh, SPDs must have a nominal discharge current rating of not less than ten thousand amps. Now, that's not a. I don't know why some people feel that people are, that that our electricians out there are going to get confused and think that that is. Um, a um, an interrupting rating or a withstand rating nope this is different uh this is just a in a nominal discharge current rating of 10,000 amps it's more related to say the treads on the tire how long that piece of a, that surge device is going how many hits it can take uh so the basically the longevity of the device when these things fail they fail silently it's not like a circuit breaker uh, that when they have identified, when they've done their job and given their life or a fuse that gives its life for your equipment, you know because the equipment is no longer powered, it's no longer functioning. When a surge gives its life to protect the equipment, you have to actually go down and look at indicating lights. So the concern here, and there's probably some expansion of this requirement uh, in the future for um, for the ratings, but right now it's just the nominal discharge current has to be 10,000 amps. Now, um, other there, now there was there, there's a few other areas. 215, very similar requirements for feeders, and then also in 225, the same type of language, because again they want the surge close to the structure. You don't want that surge product out there at the road at your surface equipment. 
you want it at the end of that feeder feeding a structure so it's the same locations dwelling in a storm between units so all of that language is is the same in a or b the surge protective device uh, actually in a the b the location is the same the type one or two the replacements are there and then the rating same 10k so those are just two other areas to be mindful of so surge saw some expansion uh, beyond dwelling units um and, but the 225 and the 215 is going to impact your dwelling unit applications. Very well could impact the dwelling unit applications. So look at that 215 and 225 requirements. Now, I believe this uh, second to last item, and we're, we're almost done. So this is a big change, I think. Um, 210.52, branch circuits. And I'll point you to, I'm going to point you to, uh, let's just talk real quick. So, added stationary appliances. Uh, stationary appliances, wall space, any uh, space two foot or more and width uh, fireplaces, stationary appliances. So they added the stationary appliances as well and fixed cabinets that do not have countertops or similar work surfaces. That's general provisions. And B, um, they just style manual cleaning up, not a big significant change in B. Um, you know, for example, as required in is replaced with shall be permitted in accordance with. So uh, they're not changing the intent. So B is pretty much the same. C. So um, island and peninsula. So here's what we did in 21052C. You know, we've gone through this debate. We've had the arguments of of um, how many receptacles do we put on a peninsula or an island we went through what's the connecting edge we talked about um in the last cycle we went to a calculation of area and we're trying to make life easy well i'll tell you what happened the consumer product safety commission sent us a note <clears throat> and shared with us data of the number of children adults, whomever, who have pulled deep fryers, crock pots off of these locations. Why? Because the receptacle is located below the countertop and the cord drapes over the edge. So what we learned was that promoting that use of, of cords going over the edge created opportunities for children, elderly, and others to pull grease, deep fryers, etc., from the countertop on top of them. And we looked at the data, and I'll tell you what we did. We said, we, we, actually, we actually went back and forth. Well, some, some people, so some of the code panel members would say, look, let's make it, uh, you're required to have a receptacle on that, on that peninsula or island, and we'll still use this, the calculation, but all the receptacles have to be in the top, like a pop-up, or two-tiered islands where you, have, you can have it on the face, but the, it can't be extending over. So we had, we had that extreme to one saying we should not permit a receptacle on an island based on the data that we saw or, or a peninsula. Uh, and then what we compromised on was that you're not required to put a receptacle on an island or peninsula. But if you do, <laughs> it has to be on the top. You can't put it below the countertop. So the way we said this, we said, Receptacle outlets, if installed to serve an island or peninsula countertop or work surface, shall be installed in accordance with 21052C3, and then we'll talk about the receptacle outlet location. If a receptacle outlet is not provided to serve an island or peninsula countertop or work surface, provisions shall be provided at the island or peninsula for future addition of a receptacle outlet to serve the island or peninsula countertop. So we what we wanted to make sure that power could be there for the future, and and um, but that's all we said. So what does what does provision shall be provided at the island or in or peninsula for future addition of a receptacle outlet? 
I'm not sure what that future provision uh, really means. And that's a point of de debate. Now, the receptacle outlet location. Receptacle outlet shall be located uh, on or above, but not more than 20 inches above, a countertop or work surface. In a countertop, using receptacle outlet assemblies listed for use in countertops, and then in a work surface, using receptacle outlet assemblies listed for use in work surfaces. And the difference between uh, a receptacle outlet assembly that's uh, for use in a work surface versus a countertop, a work surface has to uh, only be able to um, withstand like a cup of water hitting it directly. Where a work surface, I'm sorry, where a countertop is like a gallon of water. Uh, and they put like a saline solution, they add some stuff in there. So, but in any case, um, there's a difference between those two, whether the receptacle assembly is for a work surface or a countertop. And that's another a little detail. So that's how we addressed the countertops, um, et cetera. So in the 2023, so we made it optional, which will probably mean you're not gonna see a lot of receptacles um, in those areas. So um, bathrooms, general overview, change the basin to sink, big deal, not. Um, we removed an informational note because it said it was duplicate. And then in basements, uh, receptacle supplying only a permanently installed premises security system shall not be considered as meeting the requirements of, uh, of uh, the basements, garage, and accessory buildings. But in reality, as we said, a premises security system can be in any room. So we would really have to take a look at that one again, because why is it just basement garages and accessory buildings? Why isn't it just in the general provision? So, but that's didn't change. So anyway, and the last one we're gonna hit is lighting. So 210.70, uh, lighting outlets shall be installed. And now the, the what we what we one of the, the terms that we added last cycle was this switch or wall mounted control device. Remember, this is like those wireless controllers for lighting. And the whole, th the concern of people on the panel was, well, I could, I may be able to, in any of my uh, installations, not pull wire down to a lighting switch, where I have a physical wire that I can, if I want to go back to a standard light switch, that I could. I could. Based upon what we did in last cycle with 210.70, you could just put a wireless device, glue it to the wall, not pull a wire to an outlet box behind it, and that controls your lights directly. The concern of the panel was they didn't want to go there, so they said that the switch or wall on a control device shall not rely exclusively on a battery unless a means is provided for automatically energizing the lighting outlets upon battery failure. So this is going to drive, in my opinion, it's going to drive the hardwiring. So if you do have a, a control device that is remotely controlling that light, you're still going to bring uh, the wires down to a switch because that controller probably relies on a battery as the means to, um, to turn something on and off. And they did not want to... Uh, to rely on. But I think the underlying true concern really is there are many on the code panel that really want to pull a hard wire down to down to the light switch. So for a lot of different reasons. If I don't want it now and I want it later. And then um, keep in mind too that f uh, Article 404, the scope of Article 404, which is switches, they said the article does not cover wireless control equipment to which circuit conductors are not connected. So they didn't want any part of these wireless controllers. All right, so I, I would say those are my biggest changes. You got 210.8, you got 210.12, uh, surge, the emergency disconnect, the six disconnect rule modification now with the meter centers, that's gonna be something to keep your eye on. Uh, islands and peninsulas, saving you some money there, um, and addressing a concern uh, and statistics, and then finally the um, the lighting, uh, that whole lighting outlet uh, discussion that we just had. So those are, I, in my opinion, are some of the significant changes that impact the um, 
residential dwelling unit. I hope you got something out of this session. I want to thank you for uh, taking your, your time uh, and spending time with me. I apologize again for having to record this one, but uh, I, I just hope that you got something out of our hour plus together. Remember to, this, to stay safe and uh, please stay healthy. Take care. Until next week, God bless. This is Tom Dimitrovich signing out for IAEI News Live. See you next week.